And I think that was so key because I don't, my first dance show wasn't until Newsies. Like it was, it was very much like Bat Boy, Tick, Tick, Boom. Um, High Fidelity wasn't dancing. South Pacific wasn't a big dance show. Sunny in the Park wasn't a big dance show. Like it really, it, and, and like, and in a way that I'm so grateful because it felt like by the time I got to Newsies and I was able to do that with all of those performers, I think without having gone through those steps, I think would have been completely different and completely not something, I mean, maybe other people would have enjoyed it, but I, I, like, I don't know if I would have. Hey there, welcome to Theatre Life Uncensored, where we peel back the curtain and reveal to you what's really working in today's industry for theatre artists just like you. I'm your host, Jim Cooney, a New York City-based director choreographer, and I'm also the founder of Amplified Artists, a membership community for theatre professionals helping you create a career and life you love. So today is our first guest interview of the second season of the show, and so we are going to kick things off in a huge way. Today, I am chatting with Tony Award-winning director and choreographer Christopher Catelli. Now, I'm sure he needs no introduction, but just in case you were living under a rock somewhere, he has choreographed over 15 Broadway shows and performed in a handful of others. He's been nominated for five Tony Awards, winning one of them, along with winning Drama Desk and Outer Critics Circle Awards, too. He choreographs for movies and television, including the Schmigadoon series, where he's twice been nominated for an Emmy. I could go on and on and on, but I think you're getting the idea. He has had a huge career. And over the course of his career, he's been moving more and more into directing. So he shares his trajectory from when he first started learning how to dance, to becoming a professional performer, to becoming a choreographer, and now to becoming a director choreographer. He also shares what he looks for in his collaborators on his projects, and also what he looks for in the performers that he hires. So this is a really juicy episode. I think you're really going to love it, and I'm very excited to share this with you. But first, I created a free resource for you to thank you for being a follower of this show. It's called Dream Career Blueprint, and it shows you exactly how to construct your dream career based on the advice of countless industry experts. And you can download your free Dream Career Blueprint by clicking the link to it in the show notes. Also, if you don't want to miss any of these episodes, hit the subscribe and get notified button so you're the first to know when the next episode is released. And last, if you want to connect with me outside of this episode, you can find me on Instagram. I'm at Jim Cooney NYC. All right, so buckle up, settle in. Here's my conversation with Christopher Gatelli. Hello, Chris. Thank you so much for being here. I know you are so very busy, so I really appreciate you taking the time to squeeze this in and uh, chat with us today. I'm happy to. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, well, you've had a huge career, so we have a lot of things to talk about. Um, but the first thing I always ask people on the show is how they describe themselves as an artist. Uh, I, th I guess I'd say I'm, I'm a collaborator. I feel like I'm a, a, a true collaborator. I feel like um, I've studied a lot of different things over the course of life and, you know, different forms of art and everything. And I, and I feel uh, I'm at my best or I, I love working with a collaborator, to pull different things out of me. And I, it's one of my favorite parts about what we get to do. Yeah. Well, I think that's what people always say about theater is it's so collaborative compared to other art forms where you're just a painter or sculptor or something. So I think that's any of us who work in here, we really love that part of the process for sure. Yeah, uh, you have to, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, you actually do have to, even if you don't, <laughs> if you don't love it, you still have to. Yes. Um, but you might be in the wrong business if you don't like doing it. Um, so what, tell us about your trajectory from the very beginning of when you're performing and like star search and everything all the way up until like now. And I know you've switched from performing to choreography, now directing and choreography. So just walk us through the whole picture here. Sure. I mean, I, I started dancing when I was about seven or eight, I think it was seven. Um, it's like Mike from Chorus Line. Like I saw my sister do it and I was like, oh, I would love to try that. It looks like fun kind of situation and started with tap. And then you had to be a certain age to do jazz. So I had to wait till 10, but then you had to take ballet too. And so then I just, kind of kept studying all different forms. And um, I'm trying to think of like the kind of the most direct route. And then I guess, and it was, it was, it was really fun to do. And then there was a, a point where it really started clicking where I felt, um, not that I was good per se, but it felt like it was something that, um, well, one that I love to do it, but, but something that really kind of spoke back to me in a weird way. And, and it felt like, and then I just was, curious about it and I just wanted to learn more and more. So cut to like, you know, grew up in kind of a competitive dance, you know, convention -y kind of thing growing up and and a teacher at one of the conventions taught at Alvin Ailey and he came up to me and he suggested, he's like, look, you know, 
we have a summer program and you know it's a scholarship program and you could really benefit a lot from it it's it's like it's there's there are male ballet classes and you know like Horton and and Graham and all these different modern techniques and and I was just like oh wow and so um you know talked with my parents and I was like yeah sure like for, for the summer that would be a great thing and and I auditioned and I got it so at like 14 I did the summer program at ALE which was just I mean it was just invaluable I mean I always say like and, and all my dance teachers growing up too were of course invaluable, but it just, I think it was not only the, the, the classes, but it was also exposure to other dancers, like from around the world right. that, you know, that went there, especially, you know, in the summer and, um, and also a lot of male dancers. Like I always say, tell people, you know, I'm old enough now, but like I'm old enough that like we didn't have like dancing with the stars or say so you think you can dance or, or even YouTube or like where you can search people. Like I didn't, I was from a small town outside of Philadelphia. Like I didn't know a lot of male dancers. Like it was basically just like my dance teacher and, and like one other guy that was at our studio, but I didn't really know a lot of male dancers. So, so to be there and have like a men's class was like, oh my God. Like, and I wasn't, <laughs> I will absolutely admit, like I wasn't great at all, but I guess like they saw potential and, and I really feel like I did benefit from that in a way that like, it just, it's the exposure and the kind of just, I don't know, like there was something about it that was really just incredible. Um, yeah, and so then it really took to me and, and I liked it so much, I asked my school if I could do half days at school and then go half days to New York. Cause I, like where outside of Philly I was, it was just, like close to New Jersey and I was just cut, cutting through New mm -hmm. Jersey to get to New York. So I was able to get like a cheap New Jersey transit monthly pass and the school worked it out. So basically I would like do my, you know, four majors in the morning and I would jump on a train. I would do three or four classes at Ailey's and then take the train back and either go to like dance school with my friends, you know, and or, or not, but, and all the homework was done on the train rides. Um, but it, but it just was like, I just couldn't stop. Like, I just, I just loved it so much. And I think then it was being in New York. And at the time, the Ailey Studios were on 44th Street, which at the um, Minskoff, which overlooked the chorus line and what the time and Broadway and everything like that. And I had never really thought about it. I was really kind of interested in going like into a company or a ballet company, but I knew I was smaller. So, but, you know, I had, had, had grit and determination, but, um, but also in that space, in the Minskoff space for studios. And at the time, Jerome Robbins was auditioning on, it was running on Broadway and they were holding auditions and a bunch of the guy, well, a bunch of the students were all like, oh, well, it's in the building. We're just going to go up. And I was like, wow, okay. You know? And so I went and I, I got kept to the end and it really surprised me at this time when I was like 16 or so. And I was like, whoa. And, and it just, and it kind of, there was something that opened and then I went to see the show. And something opened up in my mind at that point, like, oh, wow, like I can, I can do this and I can like still tell story, but like in this other form mm -hmm. and like, and a really fun form and drum Robbins, you know, there's like a million different styles and like one choreographer could do all this work and it really kind of got embedded in me. And so, it, so then I just kind of went on the path towards Broadway because I, I, I've, it just felt that felt like the right move. Um, so that that's a bunch of my like uh, learning. And then I auditioned for the Radio City Christmas show when I was 17. Same thing, the like backstage was out and, I, and it's and it specifically said, I will never forget this. It was like, you know, male dancers, five, 10 and up, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm like five, seven, five, eight on a good day. And and I was like, well, I'm going to go anyway, because, you know, it's a it's a free class or whatever, you know, just to like try something different and how cool. And I went, but I, I got, kept, I, they kept me and I was really surprised. And, um, and then I went, came to the callback and the director was there for the callback and it was Scott Salmon, who was the director of Bacage, uh, originally and Mac and Mabel and a bunch of other amazing things. And Scott was a beautiful man. And, um, and he was like, wow, he's like, you, he's like, and he created a solo for me in the Christmas show, uh, Carol the Bell's like feature. It was like all ballet tricks. <laughs> and I was like, this is bonkers. I, you know, I was just like, this is amazing. And, um, and so it was, it kind of really, it kind of resonated that and felt like it, I was on the right, like the right path. And I learned so much from Scott and the dancers in that group. And, and it was amazing. And then, um, 
cut to the, the, the associate choreographer of the Christmas show was also Chris Chapman's associate for Guys and Dolls, the, the Nathan Lane Faith, Faith Prince revival by Jerry Zachs. And she was like, we're holding auditions for the national tour. You should go. I think Chris would like you. And I was like, sure, you know. And I went in and I got it. And it, it's, you know, and we always talk too that it was like with Andy Blankenbuehler and Sergio Trujillo. And like, it was that, that group of men that was just, it was such a, a time. Like it was this, again, it's the same thing. It's like, like, it was so rare to find that many men that like did that. And it was just to be among that at that level was just like, it was so exciting and inspiring. And, um, and we really set off each other. And, but the, the, the true, the true turning point, like this was like a life moment was we had a rehearsal one day and we were doing crap shooters and, and Chris, we were, we were not on our game or like, we just were tired. Oh, who knows what the reason was, but Chris got kind of got snappy with us and was like, you guys, he's like, we're ending early today. You're not, you're not on it. You're not hitting it. And, and he said, you, you know, go home after rehearsal. And he said, go through the entire show. He said, and if there's there's one step that you can't think of an intention for, give out, then I'll give you a dime. I mean, that part was, but but it was like this challenge. And he kind of said, like, you know, we spent a lot of time crafting this. You just throw the stuff away. And, you know, and I went home and I went through the whole show. And I was like, I mean, and a, light, a light bulb truly went off. I was like, I never thought about dance in that way. I mean, it, it was kind of telling a story, but it, but it was kind of like my personal story or like my style or my, my, what I could give to it, but not like how it serves bigger thing, you know, cause it just would never put in that context. And I was, it just, just clicked in my head and I, um, and that's when I, I, I kind of it was on the path of being a choreographer for like, it felt like that night, it kind of gave birth to that it, it, because when I went back to work, to shows not that Chris did, it was really hard to find intention unless they had it, but it was rare that a show did. Like it was, it was like, oh, do this step because, or this is flashy or something. And, and, and it really, and so I didn't last that long uh, being a performer anymore because I just was so itching to be on the other side of the table then and create. Um, so that's kind of that, tra that was that transition. And, um, and then, yeah, so I, I, my last show was Fosse on Broadway and, Throughout my time performing, I was also, I started choreographing for, um, I did my first thing for Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS, and, but one of their benefits. And they saw my work and they said, oh, we want you to do the Easter Bonnet next year, the opening. And I was like, oh my, great, I'd love to. And um, and it just so happened that it was at the New Amsterdam when it was re being rebuilt and re restored. And so it was a big deal. It was the first time that New Amsterdam was open. and. Um, and we brought back like five of the original Ziegfeld Follies dancers. And it was really like fun celebratory opening number. And, and it just so happened that Rosie O'Donnell was in the audience that show. And one of the Ziegfeld women actually still danced. So she danced our ensemble for a bit of it. They did a bit of a tap thing. And she's like, I want that on the show. She was like, that's, that's fantastic. And so we brought, her name was Doris Eaton Travis, a, the most amazing woman. Um, and we brought her and some of our guys on the show and we did our number and it was fine. And then Jerry Mitchell was the choreographer for her at the time. And he had to, uh, leave the show because he was off to do full Monty and he was like on that full time and they, they needed a choreographer and Rosie was like, Oh, what about that guy that was just here? I mean, that was a great number and all that stuff. And, and they were like, okay, let's try him out on an episode. And I literally had done nothing. I mean, I had just I mean, the benefits and stuff, but like, you know, way wet behind the ears, but I went in and I, I studied all this stuff I needed to. I did looked at the camera blocking and what cameras did what. And, you know, and I did a, a number and it was Nickelodeon based. And, um, so we had, she had to get slimes and all that stuff, but it went, went really well. And, um, and then they were like, great, you have the job. And then the next job was like off to Disney world doing these like on location shoots. And it was just like, woo, you know, it was like, full on learning, but learning, um, on the job, but it was so, it was such a great time. And then I think because of working on her show, I, I developed a, uh, let me explain this, like, um, a, a way of working that like, I was always, when I was choreographing before her show was always like dotted I's and cross T's, like everything I went in, it was all done. 
this is where it is. This is the spacing. These are the, you know, but with her, like things would change in a moment for TV. I mean, it just, it's like, oh no, we have to, this is blocked off, you know? And so you have to be flexible and malleable. And so I, that was definitely a thing I've t continued to take with me as, as I grow. But, um, but because of that opportunity, it was like, oh, he's, he's works on the Rosie O'Donnell show. And so things started coming a little bit more. And, and I got my first, my first off Broadway show as a choreographer was Bat Boy. And then that just led to, to things and, and the snowball started rolling. And then, yeah, and I forget, I forget which my actual, what my actual first thing was, but, but I did a few, I directed a few concerts and benefits for Broadway Cares and, and uh, the Actors Fund. And based on that, someone asked me to direct Silence the Musical off Broadway. And, and I did, and it got nice, some nice acclaim and it ran for a long time. And as far as off Broadway goes and, um, and that got that path going and it just, it was happening so not fast, but faster than I thought. Like I thought there was like a, a, a step system <laughs> that I was going to have to do. And it was kind of like, Oh gosh, kind of thing. And, um, and constantly, but it kind of fed that, that like, even when I was younger, like I always wanted to learn a new style and I always wanted to, like, I just couldn't, I just wanted to learn. So all of these opportunities kept feeding that, which was so, so perfect. And, and, you know, I was always willing to learn and, and listen. And, um, so yeah, so I, I mean, and then things just, did, they went on that path, went from off Broadway to Broadway and, and now directing more of my own shows and wearing both hats and that's great. And, but it's also, I love not only doing that, like I still would love to just choreograph with someone because of that collaborative aspect that, you know, you miss when you're, when you do it all yourself, or I'd love to just direct and have someone else choreograph something like I'm like, I, I, it, 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 everything will always continue to teach me. So, uh, any, any path is always welcome. So that's the long, long version, but <laughs> no, thank you for sharing all that. I, you know, I think it's, I see a lot of choreographers and myself included that like switch into directing because of what you said, you're so focused on the intention and the storytelling. And so it's not just with the choreography, but the scene changes and then the director's helping or asking you to help with like a character is the way they walk on stage and things like you start to do all these things, basically everything but the lines that they say, helping quote unquote direct all this stuff. And so it's just a natural transition. Like, okay, now you just start adding the text in. And most of us were performers before we started choreographing anyway. So we already have the acting training from that. So it's, it seems like it's a good, you know, transition for that. And um, I don't know. I just feel like if you had the movement background as well, it just makes you a more well-rounded director because you can see more than just like the acting beats and the, the subtext and, you know, the conflicts and things like that, but just the visual look of the show, you also have a say with too. So I think that's awesome that you did all that. And I think one other thing I would love to add, just cause it, it was an important thing. And if this helps anyone, but I think what also really, what I'm really happy about, like, you know, everyone has their own path, but like, I'm really happy the way mine went the way it did in that, um, like when I came out of the gate as a choreographer, I wanted to just like dance, dance, dance. Like I really wanted to like, I wanted to make a mark and like, you know, have people dance their butts off. And you know, like just, I, you know, there's that that thing that you want to kind of just put out there and it, you know, flashy and all that stuff. And, and I was waiting for that. And then I think, you know, like whoever's looking over me, like it was Bat Boy being my first, like kind of, and I say first, like being first in New York that was like gonna be, people were gonna watch and <laughs> have opinions about it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and um which is nerve wracking, but, but I think like, I'm so happy that was my first because I learned really fast in that process. Like it wasn't a dancing ensemble. I mean, the, the cast was, they were amazing actor singers and yeah, they danced, but it wasn't a dance show in that way. And I think even though in my head and in, for me, like I had intention behind the ideas behind the steps and the ideas behind what the things were and the numbers, but I think I really learned how to talk to actors on that show. Like I read that, and that was the most valuable gift in this trajectory that, that pro probably of any of it, because I, I don't know if I would have, I, if I would have missed that step, I, I don't, I, I think I would have maybe not be doing it right now because I think it's such a key tool to know that like when you're, when you're, when you're in a company, well, even when there's not, but like, as, as you're saying, like, like, like sometimes the director will have the actors and like, we'll get the ensemble sometimes. And then as a choreographer, you have to do a lot of that anyway, but then, 
but then if you but if you are able to speak to the, to the, the actors in that in a way that makes sense to them and everyone takes notes differently and everyone like you really learn how to like oh this person likes to hear it like this this person likes to hear it like this this person likes being very direct this person loves a compliment first and then I, like it's 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 kind of being a bit of a, a therapist you know psychiatrist but like it's but you really do learn that like you really learn how to like oh they they're not going to want to hear that right now maybe later you know and and i think that was so key because i don't my first dance show wasn't until newsies like it was it was very much like bat boy tick tick boom um high fidelity wasn't dancing martin short show wasn't it was i mean it was marty but it was you know it, was, it wasn't a big dance show south pacific wasn't a big dance show sunday in the park wasn't a big dance show like it really and and like and in a way that I'm so grateful because it felt like by the time I got to Newsies and I was able to do that with all of those performers, I think without having gone through those steps, I think would have been completely different and completely not something. I mean, maybe other people would have enjoyed it, but I I like I don't know if I would have. Right. Now, you know, like I I can look back and go right like that felt good and like those boys always had an intention, and you know like it was it, it felt like the right time. Yeah, and I was really uh, so that I really uh, am grateful for that, like the the way everything laid itself out because because um, you can have intention and you can still do that, but but there's still the the other level of talking to the actor, which is a whole other skill, which is so important. But it makes the transition to director that much easier because you 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 just do it anyway, yeah. Like you've been doing it, so. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that about having to talk to actors because when younger people ask me for advice, that's the first thing I always say is like people management, making sure people feel supported and they feel heard is that it doesn't matter what dance steps you give someone. But like you said, if, if you make them feel comfortable and safe and you can speak to them and, and help them bring out their performance, because everyone wants to do their best job and do their best performance. So you want to help foster that instead of like, no, this is a step, do it this way. You know, that that's not work. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's collaborate, you know, it's yeah. like, and that's the thing, like back to the, it's, and it's a collaboration with them because it's like, how does this feel for you? You know, like, what do you need? How can I help? Like, cause that sometimes, and some, they, some will be very forthcoming and like, I feel really exposed here. I feel really, you know, I have no idea what this line means, you know, or whatever it is. And it's a, it's a dialogue and mm -hmm. it's, cause it isn't like, oh, say it like this, or, you know, it, it's very much a, a dialogue. And I, again, it's like my favorite part. Yeah. So. Well, and your work is going to look better. If they feel good about what they're doing and they feel comfortable, they're going to be better. It's going to make your work look better. And, you know, like you, it's impossible to be in someone else's body. So something might feel good to you, but if it doesn't feel good to them, then let's figure that out. So for sure. And it's for kind sure. of like what you're saying with the Disney thing where you went in and you had like everything lined out. Cause I feel like when I started, that was my thing too. And you learn quickly, like, Oh, this is a waste of time to do. I mean, yes, you want to have an idea and you want to have phrases to start playing with in that, but it's all going to change. And so, you know, the pressure that I used to put on myself to have all the charts done. And I think producers do that too. Cause they're like, you have two weeks to put the show together. So like get all this, you know, pre-production done. You're like, okay, but it's still going to change. Even if I did do all that and have it already. So I think it's like just giving yourself the freedom and, and the trust to do that. Literally. And the, tr and the, and the trust that like, and, and, and I think we've, we've spoken about this on another, another time, but like, but, and we both worked with him, but Bart, I always say too, like, he's one of those moments, like the key, you know, where like the key just fits and it's like, ah, like awakening where, you know, my first collaboration with him on South Pacific, you know, e even, even if I didn't go in with like the T's crossed and I's dotted and it was, you know, even if I went in with 70% or 60, you go in with 0% with Bart. Like it's, you know, the, fr my first meeting with him you know, I, I asked, I was like, oh, so when do we do pre-production? He's like, oh, no, we'll do it in the room. And I was like, literally, I, like shivers, like ice <laughs> ran through my body. I was like, we well, were not going to talk about or you don't want to see anything. And he's like, oh, no, we'll just make it up on the spot with them in the room. Behind my eyes, like that's like yeah. my that's my that was my nightmare. Like, I don't like improv. Like, I don't like that is that like an improv within a cast of 40 people, mm -hmm. like terrified. And he's like, just, you know, if you do your research, you'll know what to do when, when it comes up. And, and I really did. And I studied the way, you know, military formations and how they walk and all this stuff, you know, and what the nurses do, all that stuff, you learn all that, you know, and then like when you have to do it in the room and he's changing things left and right, because it's, of course it's prerogative, but also because like he's, he's figuring it out too. He gives himself and he gives everyone the permission to figure it out. 
And it's like, oh, right. It doesn't have to be perfect the first time up. And like, we can shape this and we can, how do we all tell this story? And what do you need here? Where would you, you know, like, and it just, it, it literally cracked my head open in terms of like, wow, like, right. If you do the research and right, the sailors read a lot of comics there. So you grab a comic and they love to play baseball at the time because that was really big in the States. So on the island, yeah, sure. You guys are throwing a ball back. Like, and then the choreography and movement would be based off of that movement. So it just layered itself so naturally and it, it, it just, it was such a, it was such a, a moment. And, and I will always take that with me too. Yeah. Like that something I still employ every single day. So. Right. Something else you said, I was going to ask you about, you were saying how when you were an alien, then that audition just happened to be in the building or that Rosie O'Donnell just happened to see your show. And then Jerry just had to go on his, like a lot of these things were like lucky breaks along the way. But so people say, oh, it's all luck. But then on this flip side, they also were like, oh, I'm not ready to go do something yet. Where you said like, oh, I didn't know what I was doing. I just went there and I had to learn on the spot. And I feel like that is the best way to learn is just run into the fire and just do it. So if you do get those lucky breaks, then just like charge into it because like you don't know what's going to happen. Like, look how it worked out for you. So it's a great example for people to see. Uh, yeah. And I always say like, whenever people ask for advice, I'm like, take anything, literally anything, because you know, there are things you learn that you will never, you can't prepare for, you know, they're, they're like, sure, you can have all best intentions, you can have, you know, and I always say, like, starting with the benefits, like, honestly, it taught me time management skills, like I, you can't, you can't plan for, because in your head, you can like, oh, great, we have these rehearsals and these dancers. And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, we don't have half the dancers today, because they're all at an open call for this or so-and-so has to go to understudy rehearsal so they can't be here. And all of a sudden your schedule gets shredded because if you weren't thinking about that. You were thinking you had this time and it's just these natural things come up or like the budget, you know, for benefit is nothing because you're hoping to raise money. So it's like, what, what can you, how much, how much can you do with, how, with little, you know, which is a great tool to always have to learn. And so like even things like that, that or how to communicate with a stage manager, how to, you know, it's literally any, any, any project, job, anything to like is worth it. Like there's going to be some value in it you, or, or you make a connection that like in 20 years, like it, it just literally always happens. That's why like it is luck, but at the same time, it's like, it's sometimes it's, it's something that you, you planted years ago, mm -hmm. you know, like, and then it just comes back around. I mean, it's it's a, it's kind of an amazing thing. Right. Well, you see people that make their Broadway debut in their 40s and their 50s and 60s. So, like, if you just keep showing up and doing the work, I mean, it's kind of a numbers game in that sense of everyone will have a lucky moment at some point. It's just being ready to go and, and uh, take advantage of it when it happens for you. Yep, absolutely. So moving into, like, doing movies then, so what was the transition from that when you were doing some TV stuff and then going into movies? I mean, uh, through through an amazing series of events. I mean, I did have the the experience with Rosie, which was amazingly helpful. But then, um, my first movie was Hail Caesar mm -hmm. with the Coen Brothers, and I think that the most amazing thing about that was it couldn't have been a better situation because we Newsies was happening at the time, and the Coen Brothers wanted like that. They wanted like a Gene Kelly style number for Channing. And, and so it was, had to be athletic and had to be like masculine and all this kind of stuff. And so they were like, oh, okay, Newsies that, you know, you can do that. And, and so when we started working together, they were just as excited about learning about like this musical theater genre on film. Cause they hadn't really done it to this extent as much as I was interested in learning about film. So the way they would walk me through things and I would do the same back to them. Like I was showing them clips of, you know, that's entertainment outtakes that would sh like show how things were done back in the day and like why you don't wear tap shoes on a set because you'll scuff all the furniture and how it's dubbed and all this stuff. And they were like, their minds were blown. <laughs> and to me, this was just kind of like, oh God, I've seen that's entertainment 50 times, you know, but, but it's those little things that like we, it was so exciting to work with each other because, and it was like, oh no, this is a one shot and you can do this. And oh no, we can have a camera that can do that. You know? So they were so, just so collaborative and great about like not holding me at task for like not knowing every nook and cranny in a way that they, because they were so excited learning back. And it just happened to be the perfect marriage of like 
our first time for each. So, and then I learned a lot on that, of course, which was super helpful then to bring with me, you know, in, as, as I go on. But, um, but yeah, it was just, it was such a great first, um, cause it was overwhelming of course, but, but I knew, like, I knew they had my back in that way, in the way that I, they, I felt they knew I had their back in, in the way of like style and like what that number could be and how to help them achieve it. And I, and so I thought it was a really great, really wonderful. Thing. Yeah. That's awesome. And in terms of like your process, so I know we talked a little bit about Bart, don't have anything prepared, but for other, other shows, like what is your typical, and I know it changes for every project, but typically like what's your ideal process as your, from the moment you get asked to do the project to like the opening night, what's your, your trajectory usually with that? Mostly, I mean, it, it, research right away. It's a lot of research and it's a lot of, I'm very, I'm very drawn to imagery when I work. Like I like to, I like to do this thing where I, I'll just like, I'll think of, I'll think of items or, or style or, or anything that has to do with the genre that I'm working in. And then just do like a deep dive on imagery. And I'll, t I'll just type in words that mean something to that style, period, genre, all that stuff. And then, and just look, and then like, I'll click on something if it, if it excites me or interests me or makes me curious about it. And then like, I'll, I'll just save a bunch of images and then I'll print them out and I'll make like a board with them. And I'll start moving things around. And then it, in some weird way, like it gets my head into what the piece is and what, like, it, like oddly, and I still have, I still keep some cause it's, it's helpful that way. But like, like all of a sudden, like a, like a color palette starts to kind of form. Like, it's just like, oh, the, this is like, you know, the jewel tone thing or the, like, or this is a very specific font that's in that, or this is, a, and you just start to see these similar things. And it's like, and it just, it, it just helps me get into the, into the world of like, then something I'm, I have to build because, and so instead of just like going to like the straightforward, this, it's like, well, how do I do an artful version of that to create the story in that can do certain things? And so, um, yeah, so it's it's it, I usually start there and then then do the the you know the hard work and like and it's always about the story. It's always about figuring out like the book and the lyrics and you know musically is music is usually it'll ebb and flow with the lyrics, but it's just making sure that like it's clear and that it moves and you know everything is important. But um, that's generally the the course of that. But even for example, though, even this is if this helps anyone too, like, but for, for dance breaks, even like I, um, I usually write out my dance breaks by hand. So like if we're, for example, cause it's the clean, the clearest one in my head. Cause I remember doing it vividly, but like for King of New York, for example, in Newsies, like we did, you know, I got, you know, I was like, okay, well, I'd love them to tap. Like we've seen them do all this other dancing and like, let's make this tap number. And so we did it and okay. And it's like, what can we, what do you find in a pub and like this restaurant plays and cups and all this, you know, all these things. And, but then it was like, we got to the point in the song and it was like, oh, okay, this is a dance break. And like, what's the story of the dance break? And so like, I literally would write it out beat by beat by hand and say, okay, you know, Catherine who has been, this is totally not what I wrote, but, but it's like Catherine who's like, the boys are ignoring her and you know, it's, you know, she's trying to get into the, the men's club. It's like, she has to outdo them to like show that she, she needs business. And, you know, and so it's all that kind of thing. And, and so, and just writing out like all of the intent and like all of that like as if it were script and then I can base a dance break off it because then whether it's, whether it's for, and that was primarily for the dance arranger so that he could have fabric to work off of to create different sounds and styles and tempos and moods for the, for the different sections. But then it's also helpful because then when you have to talk to the, the actors, the performers, it's like, Oh, it's this basically you, you like, you're trying to bust down on that, you know, I'll, and then you, it's really clear. You can tell them that story. So it's not just like, Oh, well we need four eights of a, a shimmy here and you're going to shimmy. Well, well, why? Like, right. what does that have to do with the story? Right. You know? So it's, so it, it's, um, and that, that's, that's always been helpful to my process is just, it's just kind of writing it out by hand and seeing it as if it were a script that I had to work off of or, you know, so that's always been yeah great. I do that same thing. And I run it by the director too, because I want to make sure that I'm in line with what, you know, they're, they obviously they have an idea of what's going to happen from A to B after the dance break or through the dance break. So before I even start working on, I just want to make sure that the director's on board or, or in sync or whatever. Um, but it's also funny you mentioned the mood board because I remember 
this was back when I was in college and I took a choreography class and that was the first thing our teacher had us do when we were picking the music. It's like, okay, before you do any steps, gather all the images that are, like you said, the style, the time period, what, what kind of story you're trying to tell and all that. And I found that so helpful that that was like become like, that was part of my practice for a long time. And then I remember one time I worked with the director and you know, like on the first production meeting, they do like the set walkthrough and all that stuff with yeah. the model. Uh, and they did that. The set designer did that, but he, the director came in with a mood board um, for the entire show. And I was choreographing at that, that show. And I was like, this is so extremely helpful because now I'm like in your head and now I know exactly what you're trying to do. And so like, I love when people do the image research, like you're saying, like, it's so helpful to me uh, as my own process. But when I know what the collaborators want, or even when they show you the sketches of the costumes and the sketches of the set, like that's ideas too. It, it's really helpful. And I found that sometimes I've done this for a couple workshops, even like sometimes I'll take, I'll take some of my, my boards. And when we do a presentation for producers, I'll put them up on easels, you know, like framing the, the presentation. And, and it's like, I'm not saying this is what the show is, but just to give you, like, I see like a lot of neon like work and I see a lot of like electricity and that whatever it may be, but like, at least it's like, this is where my head is, you know, like a lot of the, like specifically it was like, there was a subway musical. And it was like, you know, a lot of like a lot of tile and a lot of like a lot of, you know, like and you get the sheen off a of tile and how light bounces off of tiles. And then like when the lights go out, then you have this neon crackling. So it's it's um, yeah, it's 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 uh, I think it's helpful even for the, for producers or for a production like team to get on your your show. It's like, oh, that's where your head is about it. Got it. You know, and, and so even before the costumes are made or anything is happening or people even invest there's like a there's at least like a a big idea that the person clearly is is like leading with which i think is helpful yeah yeah i, I totally agree um last thing i want to ask you about is uh when you're choosing your collaborators if you get hired first and you get to choose your collaborators what your process is and what you look for in that and then also when you are casting actors and dancers and performers what your process is for that or what you know what are the things you're looking for I, when it's when if it like for like now for example if I'm directing and choreographing or you know if for my team for my choreographic team it's usually people I, I I'll try to someone who's very proficient at whatever style it is so because there are certain times when I may not know everything about a certain style and I'm happy to to learn of course but to be able to, but just to make sure that someone can demonstrate that style to that level so that there's no question um, and sometimes that that happens with more than one style. And then in that case, like with my fair leave, for example, like, so I'll bring in an outside like ballroom instructor, even for the day to go, this is a proper Viennese waltz. Like, this is what it is. Like, because there is, because sometimes I feel like there's going to be terminology that someone who does it every day of their life is going to be able to tell people in ways that like, I, I could say, sure, like lead with the heel, but there may be different verbiage that comes with that, that like different people may pick up on that just helps them and gives them confidence. So like I, it's like whatever's gonna help the piece really. Um, so, and, and then in terms of like a team too, even aesthetically, like like another fun example is like how it integrate, how how that artist, designer, et cetera, is how they integrate with the story. Like for example, like I'm, I'm working on Jungle Book right now and you know, the set designer, like like her her mandate is that she only works with like recycled found items like it's just that's her like mission statement of her work which for jungle book because you know of, of, you know when the forest burns down it, the jungle burns down and all of this kind of stuff like there's a there's a deeper message in our show about that and so like but like knowing that's her mission statement that it's like oh you're perfect for the show because that's what i want to invoke that that like right we need to make change and make, uh -huh. make people you know and same thing with the costume designer like it's the same like she only works with like upcycled clothes, like all of the clothes, you know, and it's like, great, because it, again, it's just awareness, but also how that contributes to the art. And then I think in terms of performers, I mean, again, just coming from it today, it's like, I, I, I love a person who enters the room very present and, and, and malleable and is, is like genuinely listening to like, cause I'll, I'll give all the clues, you know, like about, I'll be very specific usually what I'm looking for. And it's it, it, and if that person's listening or if they're just kind of there for them to show what they can do, there's a difference in terms of like, I can see them listening and I can see them 
present in the combination because they've li listened, or I can see if someone's just dancing hard because they're just dancing hard. Um, so that that's usually it because I because you know you want people to be them themselves and you want to hire like their true selves because you want that in a room and and um, and all of that. But you know I usually say too, for, for, you know for uh, like advice kind of things it's like you know be like just be be as prepared as you can like that's because that's literally all you can do like what i didn't know as a performer is there are so many things that go on behind the table that you have no idea about and you have no control over you know like today we're auditioning for death becomes her we already did a lab in the summer like some slots are filled just because of like we did a lab and people were great and you know so it's like so it's it, it there are so many pieces of of the puzzle that, that sometimes you just don't know. And I remember as a performer, I would be so hard on myself. Like I, if I got cut or if I didn't get it, it's like, oh my God, but I, I was so good today. Or like, I thought I did great. Or I thought they were looking at me and they liked it or whatever it is. And, and I, and I, and I'll stop people on the street and I'll tell them you were amazing. I mean, I, like, it didn't go your way, but like you, you killed it. And I can't wait to work with you. And because it's, I feel like it's important to take that off your plate. Cause I think like doing this business is hard enough. It, it, it just is that like, you just have to like honor yourself in it, you know, like, and be good to yourself in it and, and, and kind of give yourself that. And, you know, so I always say like the, the one thing you do have control over is your preparation, like, like go to class, like take class and like try different styles, keep up to technique so that when you're in there, you're not falling out of the single or double turn like you should you shouldn't have to worry about that then mm -hmm. i mean actually it said today like people like their eyes glaze over when there's like a string of Sinead turns or there and it's like no 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 you shouldn't this isn't when you're supposed to be thinking about how to do right. like 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 kind of get that arsenal going with like technique and get that ready and you know make sure you have songs in your book that you can feel comfortable singing that you're just not trying for the first time and definitely have a couple because sometimes they ask and mm -hmm. you know and and right. and and look at a side make sure you've gone over it and and I always say too like and it never has to be perfect like nothing is perfect and you know that's what rehearsals for you know but it's it's seeing someone who's game it's seeing someone who like looked at the sides and like made a choice it might not be the right choice but like it shows me that like well at least they looked at it and like as opposed to someone who was like reading like this, like, right? No, they actually put in the time, and and then I feel like then if you do all of that and you like leave the room, then like great, I did what I could, and you leave it in the room, and then whatever happens happens. But at least you go, you leave going, but I did my best, and on, then on to my day. And I always I feel like that's that's the that's the best thing you could just give yourself is is that 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 chance to mm -hmm. be your best. Yeah, I feel like performers here say that all the time about how there's so much going on behind the scenes. But I think until they actually see it for themselves, they can't really comprehend. It's not their fault, but it's like you don't really realize how crazy it is. It's like, OK, well, that person's a principal, so this person has to cover them then. And that person's at height, so they have to be attached to this person. And this person has this skill, so we need this over here. And like it, like one piece could change. It's like Jenga, like one piece could change and the whole oh. thing falls apart and they have to build it up a different way. So it's yeah, I think just like you said, do your best and you know, some things are going to go your way. Some things aren't even for directors or choreographers or anyone in the business. No one gets all the jobs they go out for. So it's just how our business works. For sure. And that's what I, and you know, and that's, that's what, like, as long as you, as long as like, you know, that too, in your head that like, you know, it's a kind of, there's no formula to what we do, you know, like as a creator, like there is not, there isn't a secret formula of like, Oh, you make, you make sure you do this in the opening number and you do right. that. Like there, it, no one, there's not a, there's not, it's like a, not a math, problem that you just go like two plus three is five like that's what it is like theater and any of the any of the arts isn't like that so as long as you like know that and give yourself again give, give yourself that permission to like you know like well i did my best like no one intends like no one goes into anything trying to not do their best or, or not make a great show or anything like that so i feel like you know so all you can do is try and work your hardest and then the rest is up to what it is but yeah well, that's yeah. an awesome note to end on. Is there anything else that you wanted to share? Or I think we covered a lot of stuff here. I was going to say, yeah, you, great question. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here and for making the time. And people are going to love this interview. So I'm so grateful for you to be here. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for having me. All right. I'll see you later. Yep. Bye. Bye. What an incredible first guest interview of this second season of the show. I think my favorite part of the conversation was when we were talking about luck and being prepared and how the best way to learn is by doing. 
So I hope you take that with you so that you can feel more confident in what you are doing. And I really love the last message about doing your best because that's all you can do. You don't have a lot of control over anything else. You just have to do your best. And so you want to place your value on that versus on if you booked the job. Because if you always show up doing your best, the numbers will work in your favor. Luck will be on your side and you will be ready. Now, before we wrap up here, don't forget you can download your free Dream Career Blueprint, which gives you the 20 essential building blocks you need to construct your career in the fastest and easiest way possible. You can download that by clicking the link to it in the show notes. And if you have any questions on today's episode or you want to keep the conversation going, just drop me a note in the comments. I reply to all of them. Or you can find me on Instagram and message me there. I'm at Jim Cooney NYC. Now, if you like today's episode, hit the like button to help more people find out about it and also subscribe and get notified so you don't miss any of our episodes. And finally, if you love the show and want to help support it, leaving a small tip is greatly appreciated and there's a link to do so in the show notes. Remember, there is no one on the planet who is just like you. Stay true to the gifts you have and who you are. Thank you so very much for tuning in today. Now, here is a little preview of next week's episode, and I will see you then. Do you feel like there's not enough time in the day, or you have too many things to get done in too short of time, or wish you just had a few more hours to get everything done on your to-do list? I bet you do, because anytime I ask artists, what is the number one thing that they're struggling with? It's always time. And the thing is, you don't need to feel like this. We have fallen prey to a lot of misconceptions about time and our relationship with time is not actually accurate. And so I'm gonna give you four phrases today that are going to change your relationship with time and four phrases you can use and come back to that are magically gonna unlock hours of your life so you can get your time back.